Good afternoon, councillors, and to those watching at home, welcome back to this meeting of the Fuel Council of Perth and Kinross. Um, I'm just going to ask the clerk to confirm those who are attending online are present, and then we will begin with the business. Thank you, Provost. Can I ask the four elected members again to confirm that they're present and online? Read here. Councillor Reid, Councillor James, present Councillor and awake. Councillor Robertson, present. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we will now move on to item nine, which is the scheme of administration, and I'm going to invite Lisa Simpson, the head of Legal and Governance Services, to summarise the proposed updates to the scheme of administration. Thank you, Provost, and good afternoon, councillors. Uh, this latest draft version of the scheme of administration before you now more accurately reflects the decision-making structure, which as a new council, you agreed at the statutory meeting earlier this year. The most significant changes to the scheme flow from the council's decision to create a new climate change and sustainability committee, but other changes in relation to the names and remits of existing committees were also made in order to better reflect the current priorities of this new council. Given the extent of the changes we were required to make, we took the opportunity to review the scheme in its entirety. So as well as reflecting the desired committee structure, we have taken the opportunity to reorder parts of the scheme so that it flows in a more logical order. The various iterations of the draft have previously been shared and most recently this version has been shared with track changes with group leaders. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the political groups for their detailed feedback which has been received in the last week or so and we have incorporated a number of suggestions and reflected the comments from the feedback where appropriate and particularly where it's enhanced clarity and understanding. If agreed today, the scheme of administration will of course continue to be monitored as it's implemented and we will continue to review and refine it as required and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from members? I'm not seeing any indications of questions. That being the case, um, Deputy Leader, would you like to move the scheme of administration? Provost, thank you. Um, let's be honest, this is um, not the most exciting paper or the most interest, interesting paper before us today. No, no offence to the, uh, the head of legal and governance and the acting democratic services manager, uh, whom I thank um, sincerely for their, uh, their patience and, uh, and their efforts to uh, pull this together. Um, but like all of the other uh, papers uh, before us today, it is an extremely important one, uh, as this document will underpin absolutely everything the Council and its committees do over the years ahead. We have reviewed the previous scheme constructively, fine-tuned it and streamlined it wherever possible, and used plain English to make it as clear as possible. A significant change is the creation of a new Climate Change and Sustainability Committee uh, to be convened by Councillor Waters, aided by the Vice Convener Liz Barrett. Another example of constructive cross-party working on uh, an issue that affects us all. Uh, this SNP administration uh, has made it clear uh, in our corporate plan, however, how, how important this committee's remit is uh, for this and future generations and we make no absolutely no apology for carving out its new role in our corporate governance structure. Importantly, this is, like the corporate plan, a document that will evolve over time. I hesitate to call it a living document, but it will evolve over time. Indeed, uh, we are uh, we're prepared to even amend aspects today if a good case can be made for doing so. Equally, if we see improvements that can be made down the line, 
we will make them in order to create the best platform we can for delivering on priorities for the people of Perth and Kinross in a fair, open and transparent way. I'm very pleased, Provost, to formally move that this paper uh, and the proposed scheme of administration be approved by Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Leader. Um, Councillor McCall to second, please. Thank you, Provost. Um, I'm very happy to formally second this uh, revised scheme of delegation and commend it to Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCall. Um, can I just remind members to please check your devices are on silent because uh, I did hear one go off there. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Councillor Brian Leishman to move an amendment. Thank you, Provost. Um, yes, uh, if I could just bring attention to uh, 29.3 on page 121. Um, just the amendment of uh, at the back of to consider the council's performance in relation to the above areas, including any feedback from internal or external scrutiny and audit activity, and where appropriate to provide comment and recommendations as to improvement actions to council, the relevant committee or service. Additionally, the committee may request that a detailed climate change impact assessment be carried out on any matter where it determines that the original proposal lacked detail in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leishman. Do you have a seconder? If I may, Provost. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Deputy Leader. Thank you. If, if you just give me just a moment to consult with my seconder and um, it may be that we are, are able to adopt that into our motion. That would be most welcome. On a point of order, Provost, would it not still require a seconder? No, it doesn't if they're going to incorporate it into the motion. It only requires a seconder if it's going to be voted on. If, if, I, if I may, Provost. Uh, so just, just two seconds while we deal with this. In terms of a point of order, Councillor Drysdale can include it in his motion when he sums up if he wishes to, and if he indicates that, there is no need for a seconder. Thank you very much for that, Provost. I, I, I thought that was only the, if, if it had been proposed and seconded, not if it's only just been proposed. No, because members can ask for incorporation of anything during the debate and the leader or whoever is moving it could incorporate whatever they wished as part of the incorporating people's comments, which you do quite regularly. Mr Deputy Leader. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, uh, and I would like to, um, the, the thank, to, to thank Councillor Leachman for um, his proposed amendment, uh, which I had sight of a short time ago. Uh, I've had the opportunity to confirm with my seconder and we are happy to include that within our motion. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Colin Stewart, you have an amendment. <coughs> Um, thank you, Provost. I wonder if we could put the text of my amendment on screen for members. Um, and while we're waiting for that, I wonder if I could um, uh, thank officers for the um, for their indulgence in um, uh, providing us with um, examples of the um, uh, proposed changes to the um, uh, scheme of administration in advance um, and for taking the time to discuss those and incorporate um, uh, a good number of changes from across um, all of the political groups on the council. <coughs> um, uh, significantly, I think that um, some of the changes which the independent group suggested have, have simplified the structure of the, the scheme of administration, which I recognise as the um, deputy leader of the council says is, is, is not the most exciting paper. Um, and I presume that's why the leader of the council delegated this to Councillor Drysdale. Um, my amendment, uh, which is on screen before you now, uh, is in relation to um, the uh, matters that are to, uh, delegated to the planning and place committee, planning and placemaking committee. Excuse me. Um, it's section thirty-one point two, um, subparagraph two, um, item C. Um, and this, the effect of this um, amendment would be um, that where a community council um, has an objection to a, um, has a valid planning objection to a uh, planning application, 
um, they wouldn't count as just one of the um, six um, individual households of businesses um, uh, um, objections that are required to send this to committee. Um, if a community council raised an objection, <coughs> it would automatically go to a, a valid planning objection. It would automatically go to committee. Um, I'm sure we all know, particularly uh, maybe in uh, some of the, the rural areas of uh, Perth and Kinross, um, the significant amount of time and effort that um, community councils put into um, scrutinising um, uh, the planning applications that are relevant to their area. Um, and obviously we've heard I think earlier in the meeting about the, you know, the the local knowledge that um, people have, um, and how that can um, enhance um, scrutiny of planning applications, um, and that this amendment would therefore be um, chiefly a recognition of the significant um, time and effort the community councils put in, uh, and of the um, particular cumulative knowledge, wealth of knowledge and experience that they have in relation to their areas. Um, the second part of the amendment, <coughs> um, where all elected members um, request that the matter be considered by the committee, um, it was felt that if we were going to um, suggest that um, community councils had a, a, an automatic right to um, object and, and, and for that to be heard by committee, then elected members should also, but um, uh, on advice from uh, legal and in discussion with the administration have amended it so that um, it's where all of the local elected members um, uh, have uh, would like something to be um, referred up to committee um, to avoid any um, suggestion that um, there might be any um, uh, political um, uh, shenanigans in, in terms of um, objecting to a uh, uh, a planning application, um, but this would allow local elected members um, to effectively call in an application where they can recognise um, maybe in the absence of a community council or where neighbour notifications don't allow, um, uh, uh, you know, in rural areas in particular where the 20, 20 metre neighbour notification rule doesn't allow for many people to be notified about a particular planning application uh, for those local members to call one in where they recognise the significant local sensitivities of, for example, a major um, development. Um, and I commend this amendment to Council. Thank you, Councillor Colm Stewart. Um, Councillor Dave Cuthbert, you're seconding this. Thank you, Provost. Yes, um, I'm going to focus more on the community council aspect. Um, we had a long discussion this morning about community empowerment and in principle community empowerment means giving power to community. Community councils represent our communities and we are currently disempowering them so that if there is an objection from a, a meeting that might be attended by 100 plus people, it's treated as being one objection from one householder. So my view on that is that we need to empower the community councils. Um, I think this is partly why we've got 21 community councils that are not currently formed out of, I think it's 53. Um, I think it's partly because we're, we're, they're becoming a talking shop because when they make a decision, it's then not being respected by the council. So I would commend this amendment to you. Thank you. Um, Councillor uh, Lane, you have a point of clarification. Yes, thanks, uh, uh, Provost. Um, it's, and I, I'm remiss because I'm only seeing this, the, the, set, the section, uh, but I would hope that the proposal has attracted an objection from a community, community council, only a community council uh, within whose area that the, the planning application is actually in, and uh, where all local elected members would be, it would only be the three or four elected members within the ward that the planning application uh, is made and I'm sure that that's what was intended by the amendment but I just want to to clarify that. Can you call Stuart to clarify? Um, certainly on the uh, second point that was why I had included the wording local elected members if um, uh, elected members for the relevant ward is better wording then hopefully um, if the amendments uh, passed then the head of legal and governance could uh, make that incorporation. Um, I'm happy to 
I'm happy. I think I'm happy to accept that it should be a community council for the area where the planning application is made. Although I would just note that it would be possible for a significant planning application to have um, knock on effects in another community council area. Um, the, the example that I can think of which actually goes across local authority boundaries um, is um, the impact of the Westfield development in Fife on one of the community council areas down in Kinrosshire um, and the road passing through. Um, so it's not necessarily the the, the immediate community council. I, I accept the point that we wouldn't want a community council in Kinloch Rannoch objecting, you know, having a statutory right to object to um, you know, uh, applications in um, uh, Aleth or something like that. Um, but there are knock on implications, particularly of major developments um, in uh, neighbouring community council areas. Um, so maybe we could um, amend the wording to um, uh, the uh, area or a neighbouring area, if that would be acceptable. If I may, Provost. Um, I wonder if we could just request a, a, a brief uh, recess just to discuss the specifics here and just to make sure that we get this right. I'll come to a recess in a second, but Councillor John Duff also has a point of clarification. So, Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask the uh, Councillor Stewart this motion uh, as the amender whether he's made any assessment of the number of objections that community councils have submitted in the past and what impact that would have on the workload of of uh, officers and of the planning and placemaking committee. Thank you. Councillor Colm Stewart. Um, I've, I've made no assessment of, of the numbers. Um, the chief issue with the first part there of the uh, amendment on the community councils was to recognise that they are democratic representative structures and they will be representing more than um, six residents. Um, so effectively downgrading a community council's objection to the status of a, <coughs> just counting as one single individual is the, is the issue which community councils face and which causes the disengagement about which Councillor Cuthbert spoke. Um, I you know, if there is a, a local planning application which um, uh, people will often choose to make their representations to um, elected members or to their community councillors instead of making objections themselves. Um, and if the weight of objections um, tips the balance um, for, a, for a community council to formally make an objection themselves. I think that that sort of um, gives them their democratic representative place in the planning process and it would significantly um, uh, go towards um, enhancing the reputation of Perth and Kinross Council with community councils where there have previously been um, uh, objections uh, raised, but um, not wholeheartedly taken on board. OK, um, Councillor Peter Barrett also has a point of clarification. Um, thanks, Provost. I'd be grateful if we could get the text of the um, um, amendment back on the on, on the screens. Can we get the amendment back on screen, please? So the point of clarification that I'm seeking is, well, when it comes, but it, it was with regard to the, 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 the paragraph um, which says where all local elected members request that the matter be considered by the, 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 the committee. And I wonder whether um, we're in danger of putting um, elected members who sit on the planning and placemaking committee uh, in an invidious position or a compromised position uh, if they have to sign up for that and then later on uh, take part in the determination of that um, application. I don't know whether the Head of Legal and Governance Services can uh, comment on that. I'm, I'm going to allow Councillor Stewart to come in first and then 
Um, thanks, Prof. <clears throat> um, so I had cons considered that, and that's why the wording is different from the first um, part of the um, paragraph to the last part. In the first part, it's an objection. In the second part, it's a, re a simple request. Um, so that it doesn't um, require those local elected members to express an opinion one way or another, just in case, for exactly this, the reason that you raise, they are a member of the planning and police meeting, making committee. But it it would, they they will still have potentially had those um, representations about a particular sensitivity within an area, um, and recognise the importance of the issue being um, decided at a higher level. Um, so that was the that was quite deliberate in the wording. Head of Legal and Governance, anything to add? Yeah, I think that reflects some of the discussion that there has been about this point with um, one of my team. Um, I think the other thing about it though, is in terms of ordinary conflicts of interest, as with any quasi-judicial, we would look and see the particular circumstances at the time, and if that meant that somebody had to declare a, a conflict of interest and couldn't partake in that, then these rules would still apply. But this isn't, the, the, the key point here is the distinction about it not being related to a, an objection per se. It would seem to me there was a pretty clear uh, relationship to an objection though. I mean, we can come to that in debate, but I think it's got nightmare written all over it. Hi, I've got a point of clarification from Councillor Keith Allen. Uh, my understanding is that there's a requirement for six objections before it's referred to committee. What happens if one of these community councils is made up of five people and it's a split vote? Much like in this chamber, presumably the majority prevails, but uh, Councillor Colin Stewart. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so it would need to be obviously a, a formal decision of a community council and therefore by majority resolution. Um, but um, in terms of there only being, for example, five members on a community council, that's not with respect to concern the point. The point is that a community council is a democratically elected representative structure for a much wider area, a much larger number of people. Um, I, I know that this um, happens in, uh, that this is allowed in other planning authorities and I think it would be constructive if we did the same in Perth and Kinross. Councillor Peter Barry, you have a further point of clarification. Um, thanks very much, Provost. Um, again, I was wondering if you'd get some guidance on the actual decision making processes within community councils. I always understood that the um, decisions taken at the community council weren't by the elected community councillors, but by everybody present at the meeting. No, they are taken by the community councillors. It's the same as this council. OK, thank you. OK. Um, I'm not seeing any further points of clarification, so therefore we're going to have a short, very short, five minute recess, um, if that's OK. OK, so quarter two.
students. Um, I think uh, a few matters have been clarified during that recess. So it was productive. Um, I'm now going to go to the deputy leader. Thank you, thank you, Provost. And I wonder if I could have the, the wording back up on screen uh, once again. Can we put the wording back up on the screen, please? OK, um, ha having taken advice uh, um, uh, and I'm, I've been assured as well that the, the chief executive and the leader uh, and the head of legal and governance can uh, uh, tweak the, the wording if necessary to uh, ensure it, fu it fully conveys what is intended here um, within. But I think we understand uh, what is mean, meant by the wording uh, that is up there at present, uh, and on the basis of these discussions that we've just had, uh, I, I'm content to uh, adopt uh, and to uh, bring the amendment into uh, my motion. And I can ask Councillor Nicole if she will uh, second that. Thanks. Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I just wonder what we're agreeing, yes. Provost. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to. I think there is uh, needing a bit of clarification there. So what is on the table before members is now uh, the draft scheme of administration, which includes uh, the incorporation of Councillor Brian Leishman's uh, proposal and the incorporation of Councillor Colin Stewart and Councillor Dave Cuthbert's uh, proposed amendment as well. And therefore, um, what it says on the screen, which we have at the moment, in terms of the proposal around community councils, um, is that if there is a valid planning objection from community council, or six or more valid planning objections from households, businesses, and addresses, or interest groups, um, or where all local ward members uh, request that the matter be considered by the committee. Um, that would be going in as well. Uh, and what was said at the start by the head of legal and governance and indeed by the deputy leader when he moved the motion, which is that this will be kept under review. And if there are any issues with the implementation of any aspect of the scheme of administration, including this, it can be brought back for changes. So this will be monitored. Um, I hope that provides clarity. Councillor Liz Barrett. Yeah, can I just ask for confirmation that it means from a community council for an area directly impacted by the proposal? Yes, but um, we're going to include that to be neighbouring ones as well, because there are very relevant. Yes, indeed. So, and that will be reflected. And I think what is important is that um, the chief executive and the head of legal governance do have the authority to make textual changes as required to ensure that what is meant by the council is reflected. Um, so we are not necessarily going to be bound by every single word that is on that screen, um, but it will reflect what we have agreed here. Councillor Peter Barr. Yeah, Provost, I'm really not trying to make uh, heavy weather of this, but um, it, it does seem like we're making uh, policy up on the, on the hoof, which I think is a particularly bad practice. Um, so what is the position uh, regarding the elected members uh, of the neighbouring ward whose community council have already all asked that uh, a, a, a planning application go to committee. Do they have to have a say in the matter? Do they have no say in the matter? Do they then have less say in the matter than the community council? So I think the uh, my understanding, and I'm going to just check with Councillor Stewart and indeed Councillor Drysdale, is it is the ward members where the planning application is, because the example that has been used, for example, would be uh, where there might not be a community council, but the neighbouring community council might be affected, but it would possibly probably be in the same ward. So my understanding is it is the ward in which the application is in. If obviously if it crossed boundaries, then it would apply to both wards affected um, potentially. Councillor Colin Stewart, Councillor Drysdale, can you confirm that as your understanding? Yes. Yes. OK, thank you. Councillor Tom McEwen. Would a neighbouring 
Community Council normally be a notifiable body for a planning application in another ward? Um, there are. We, we, we ha over at the side here, we have had a number of discussions about a number of examples, um, including ongoing planning applications where there's a lot of examples of this. Um, I think it probably happens more often in rural ones, actually, where there's maybe big applications around forestry, for example, um, or other energy applications where it can have a significant impact on neighbouring local uh, neighbouring uh, community council area. Is that not the regulations around major applications compared to just all applications? They don't necessarily qualify as a major application, there's just maybe a large application. Okay. Everyone have clarity. Okay. Any other amendments or comments on this? Or can we move to Councillor Peter Barrett? Um, thanks, uh, Provost. I think I would like to move deferral um, of Councillor Stewart and Councillor Cuthbert's uh, motion. I think it's raising more questions than it, it, it answers. And I think if it was to be referred to uh, a planning and pl place making member officer working group um, considered in full uh, and a written report brought back, then that would be a far better way um, of proceeding than um, being bounced into a decision that maybe a quarter of the councillors have shared discussions on uh, and the three rest of the three quarters of us are uh, largely in the dark about. So um, that is my amendment or my motion. OK, I'm going to take that as an amendment and Scott is going to advise around how that would work. Oh, apologies. Uh, thank you, Provost. So just to clarify, so Councillor Barrett, your amendment is now to agree um, the original motion from Councillors Drysdale and McCall, which incorporated the suggestion of Councillor Leesman, um, but not um, the proposed amendment from Councillor Stewart and Cuthbert, and defer that particular matter to a future meeting. OK, um, Councillor John Duff wishes to second the amendment. Uh, yes, I, I think um, whilst they're not necessarily against in principle, what, what uh, Councillor Stewart is proposing, I would like a little bit more time to uh, have some of the answers to these questions um, resolved uh, to my satisfaction. So I'm happy to second Councillor Barrett's amendment. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, are there any other comments at this time? No. OK, I'm going to invite uh, Councillor Drysdale as the move of the motion to sum up. Uh, thank sorry, you. Sorry, I do apologise. And Scott has given me right here. Councillor Barrett, as the mover of the amendment, does get the right to sum up, first of all. Happy Councillor to Barrett. move that, thanks. Thank you, Dean. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Provost. Um, I said in my uh, uh, opening remarks on, on this paper uh, that uh, we are prepared to consider uh, suggestions and amendments and proposals from across the chamber um, that reflect our priorities as an administration. And um, I understand that this is new ground we're, um, we're entering into here, but uh, wh what my view is that that we should be encouraging uh, the role of community councils across uh, Perth and Kinross and uh, and taking heed of their uh, uh, their considered views on on matters that affect uh, residents in in their areas, uh, and I am persuaded uh, by the argument uh, that has been put forward by Councillor Stewart. Uh, that the amendment as worded uh, or as uh, set out by him uh, this afternoon uh, is on balance uh, the right way forward. Um, and we, as I also said in my opening remarks, 
we are um, quite prepared to um, review matters as as things go on uh, and see how it is working. But I think it is workable, uh, and therefore I as uh, I, I continue to support the motion as amended, both by uh, by both the amendments that have been put forward. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Drysdale. Um, therefore, members, we will go to a vote um, and the vote is between uh, a motion by Councillor Drysdale, seconded by Councillor McCall, which incorporates Councillor Leishman and Councillor Stewart's amendments. And we have an amendment uh, by Councillor Peter Barrett, seconded by Councillor John Duff, which is to proceed with the scheme of administration as on the order paper. Um, with the incorporation of Councillor Leishman's amendment, but not Councillor Stewart's, and that that item be deferred for consideration and be brought back to the next council meeting, as I understand it. OK. Thank you, Provost. Can I therefore invite members to confirm if they're voting for the motion or the amendment? Bailey Ahern. Amendment. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Amendment. Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Councillor Liz Barrett. Amendment. Councillor Peter Barrett. Amendment. Councillor Braun. Amendment. Councillor Carr. Motion. Councillor Chan. Amendment. Councillor Cuthbert. Motion. Councillor Donaldson. Motion. Councillor Drysdale. Motion. Councillor Duff. Amendment. Councillor Frampton. Motion. Councillor Freshwater. Amendment. Councillor Harvey. Motion. Councillor Illingworth. Amendment. Councillor James. Amendment. Councillor Kogali. Amendment. Councillor Lang. Motion. Councillor Leishman. Motion. Councillor McPherson. Motion. Councillor Massey. Motion. Councillor McCall. Motion. Provost. Motion. Councillor McEwen. Motion. Bailey McLaren. Amendment. Deputy Provost. Motion. Councillor Rebeck. Motion. Councillor Reid. Amendment. Councillor Robertson. Motion. Councillor Shires. Amendment. Councillor Smith. Amendment. Councillor Colin Stewart. Motion. Councillor Grant Stewart. Motion. Councillor Waters. Motion. Councillor Welsh. Councillor Williamson. Bailey Williamson. Motion. Provost, we have 21 votes for the motion and 16 votes for the amendment, so the motion is carried. Thank you, Scott. Um, members, we now move forward to item 10, which is the medium term financial plan, and I'm going to invite Stuart McKenzie, the head of finance, to introduce the report. Mr McKenzie. Thank you, Provost, and good afternoon, councillors. Can I just check that everyone online can hear me? I assume so, thank you. In advance of this meeting, a briefing was arranged on the medium term financial plan, and members will be familiar with many of the issues reflected within the report. I will therefore focus upon the main issues and provide a brief update on the immediate implications on the council's budget of the Chancellor's financial statement last week. 
a briefing note for elected members on this subject has been prepared. I will also briefly comment on the implications of recent increases in the bank rate on the Council's borrowing. The medium term financial plan models optimistic, mid range and pessimistic scenarios to provide an indication of a financial challenge facing the Council over the next six years to 2028-29. Given the combined impact of high levels of inflation, anticipated constraints in funding, increasing demand for services and the cost of living crisis, Perth and Canals Council, in common with all Scottish local authorities, is facing a period of unprecedented pressure on its revenue and capital budgets. The mid-range scenario, which is adopted for financial planning purposes, shows a potential requirement to reduce expenditure for savings and or additional income by £103.5 million over the six-year period to 2028-29. More immediately, the projected budget deficit for next year has been revised upwards from the £24 million supported in the financial strategy in June to £30 million. The key assumptions and approach reflected in the plan are set out in sections 5 to 7 and appendices A and B to the report. The Scottish Government's resource spending review published in May showed that local authority funding in total is assumed not to increase over the period to 2025-26, with a 1% increase in 2026-27. The medium term financial plan therefore assumes no increase in Scottish Government funding until later years. In a period of significant inflationary pressure, this represents a real terms reduction in funding. The plan has, however, been modified to reflect the Council's anticipated share of the funding being made available by the Scottish Government for pay awards in 2022-23. Excuse me. The Scottish Government has subsequently announced an emergency budget review with the Deputy First Minister due to report the results of the review to the Scottish Parliament in the week beginning 24th October. At present, the Council still anticipates the publication of the Provisional Local Government Finance Circular in December, which details funding at an individual authority level, although this may be impacted by recent events. National negotiations on current, on current year pay awards remain ongoing through COSLA and have not been agreed for all staff groups. The medium term financial plan has been updated to reflect the estimated recurring cost of the latest offer and anticipated Scottish Government funding for pay. The current COSLA pay offer is, however, not fully funded and the Scottish Government have been requested to grant Council's flexibility to redirect funding from national policy priorities towards pay. For the purposes of drafting the plan, pay awards of 3% have been assumed from 2023-24 onwards in the mid-range scenario, although there is significant financial risk around pay. And for illustration, a 1% movement on pay award assumptions equates to approximately £2.25 million for all staff groups. The plan also makes assumptions on the financial impact of movements in general inflation, demographics and demand, in employee pension costs and on operating costs for new facilities. For modelling purposes, an assumption has also been made of a 3% annual increase in council tax from 2023-24 onwards in the mid-range scenario, but it is of course for elected members to determine the actual level of council tax in setting the budget. The Council has a statutory responsibility to set a balanced revenue budget, and officers are currently working on detailed multi-year budget submissions, which will supersede the broad estimates reflected within the plan. The Council's budget and medium-term financial planning are vehicles for ensuring resources are directed towards the Council's strategic priorities and areas of greatest need, and this will be reflected within revenue budget submissions, which will be provided for members' scrutiny from late October oblique early November onwards. Members will be aware of the pressures in the Council's capital budget, and it is proposed that the capital budget is considered alongside the revenue budget in February. In September, the bank rate increased to a 14-year high of 2.25%, with further rises expected. The Council predominantly funds its capital investment through long-term borrowing from the Public Works Loans Board. Although not directly linked, PWLB rates have risen over the last few months. In response to increases in the bank rate, and more recently, 
in light of immediate market reaction to the Chancellor's financial statement last week. The Council is forecast to have no requirement for additional borrowing to finance its capital programme for the next 12 months due to the advanced borrowing undertaken last year. The capital, fun excuse me, the capital budget funding strategy will be reviewed in consultation with our Treasury advisors as a more settled view on long-term borrowing rates and mergers. Officers are continuing to progress with the delivery of individual approved capital projects and the development of final business cases, which will be considered and monitored by the Finance and Resources Committee. Officers are also working on developing an overall corporate asset management strategy. In terms of immediate developments, the Chancellor's financial statement included the withdrawal of a social care levy on national insurance contributions. This represents a cost saving to the Council of approximately £500,000 in the current year and £1.5 million on a recurring basis. These savings are not reflected in the estimates as the report was issued in advance of the Chancellor's statement. The budget consequentials for Scotland of the Chancellor's statement are estimated to be more than £600 million. And as I noted earlier, the Scottish Government have announced that they will report on their emergency budget review in October, including their response to the Chancellor's statement. Separately, the real living wage rate was announced on the 22nd of September, with an increase in the rate from £9.90 to £10.90 per hour. This has a limited impact on the Council's own employees, as only a few are paid at this rate, but may have wider implications for Council suppliers and providers. To conclude, the report recommends that the Council sets a final revenue budget and Council tax for 2023-24 and provisional revenue budgets for following years in February 2023, together with the capital budget and reserve strategy. Following consultation with Council tenants, it is proposed to set the housing revenue account budget and rent levels on the 18th of January. Happy with colleagues to take questions, Provost. Thank you very much, Mr McKenzie. Are there any questions on the report, members? Councillor Liz Barrett, first of all. Thank you, Provost, and thank you, Mr McKenzie, for this plan. Um, we appreciate this was circulated last week before the announcement of the Conservatives' mini-budget, which is including tax cuts that are widely expected to increase the divide between rich and poor in this country, the temporary support for energy costs to be funded by our children and grandchildren, increased pressure on those receiving benefits, and the hikes in mortgage rates that are partly a result of the market responses to the mini-budget. The usual forecast for the Office of Budget Responsibility. Sorry, sorry Councillor Barrett, is there a question? Coming? It is, yeah, it's just the context of the okay. question that I'm appreciating okay. the situation that Mr McKenzie is in um, and the uncertainties that face them, because usually we have a forecast from the Office of Budget Responsibility giving the impact of in, what's indeed, been announced. Can we skip to the so, question, yeah. please? Okay, um, so as you said, we're not going to get any of that information till uh, October from the Scottish Government and um, the, the 20, the November date for um, the Office of Budget Responsibility. So my instinct in all this is that this is going to increase the challenges facing the Council's finances and that we should be adopting a more pessimistic review, uh, as, as a more pessimistic view than is set out in your paper. And my question is, would you agree with that instinct? Mr McKenzie, can you switch your microphone off, Councillor Barrett? Thank you for your question, Councillor Barrett. Um, I'm going to pause before I answer. The, the projections in, in the report as they stand are the most challenging I've ever had to, to present to Council in terms of medium-term financial plan. I suspect that's the case in 31 of the local authorities. Um, and certainly the most challenging I've seen in my experience and indeed in, in the experience of my colleague, Mr Walker, um, over 27 years or thereabouts of being involved in, in the Council's budget. I think that um, the situation is highly uncertain at the moment, um, and we need to be aware of the potential for, for position to worsen. Uh, I, like elected members, I'll be interested to see what comes out of the emergency budget review by the Scottish Government. Um, at, the, at the moment, um, our, our projections are based on a medium-term scenario, but there's obviously variation between that. 
So we're saying £103 million pounds over a six-year period. Um, the, the worst case scenario that we've mapped out is potentially £190 million. Pounds. So I think that there's an absolute challenge for the Council over the coming months and years in managing its finances, but it's a very, very uncertain period. So we've we've gone with assumptions we've got at the moment, bearing in mind that all of those will be revised over the coming months. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Peter Barrett. I'll try and be very quick to compensate, Provost. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, paragraph 3.7 of the report states that many of the assumptions set out in the report will change over time. Did the Head of Finance expect all of them to change within the space of the week? And what are the most serious changes which will have the severest impact upon the Council finances? Thank you, Councillor Barrett, for your, for your question, and I'm sure that <clears throat> you will suffer later for your opening comment. Um, in terms of the the, uh, the expectations, um, clearly nobody had anticipated the, the Chancellor's, the, the breadth, perhaps, of uh, the Chancellor's financial statement and the impact that would have. I focused in my comments on the things which directly impact and which we can quantify at this, this point in time on the Council's own, own finances and budget setting, but clearly there are uh, potentially wider um, societal consequences, depending on how the markets react, depending on what the Bank of England needs to do to manage inflation down. I'd be speculating on that, but it's absolutely a watching brief, and I appreciate the Council has this morning established a poverty commission, and I'm sure that there will be some interaction between what's happening in, in the local and national economy and the work of that poverty commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McKenzie. I see no other uh, questions in the... Oh, Councillor Collins, you're just getting in there. Thanks, Provost. <clears throat> um, I was really just um, uh, being a placeholder for Councillor Robertson, but um, I do have a practical question on um, the recommendations two, three and four. Um, I appreciate we're not discussing the Council's timetable for uh, 2023 later in the agenda today. Um, but are we fixed on the 22nd of February? I know that it has been fluid in previous years, particularly with um, the um, timing of the Scottish Government budget announcement. Um, that can be right up to the wire. So is, is that fixed or, or uh, m is it a movable feast? I can answer that question, which is it's always put down as a provisional date anyway, um, and we usually have two council meetings about a week or two apart, um, which allows us to swap them around as well. So if we need a later date, there is potentially the ability of a later date. Councillor Willie Robertson. Uh, thank you, Provost. Um, this is a, a really um, difficult paper to take in. And with, because of the huge implications it has for Perth and Kinross in the, the medium term. Um, we, are, we are busy working on the Perth City Hall just now with a view to opening it in 2024. Given the anticipated running costs of Perth City Hall when it becomes a, a museum, um, is there a strong possibility that it might not even open? Um, I I'm going to go to the leader of the council who has um, indicated he wishes to reply to this. Uh, I thank, uh, I don't know if it's a question to me, but I thank Councillor Robertson for raising it. Uh, anything like that because um, we are going to face difficult times moving ahead and um, uh, moving things forward. But no, I can assure him that we had a, a project board of uh, Perth Museum uh, yesterday and uh, it will be um, definitely uh, on schedule to open. I think, uh, given all the archaeological works and everything, I think the project, which has been expertly managed by our, our council team, is only four or five weeks behind because of archaeological stuff they had, and it's still fully on plan to open in uh, in 2024. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leader. Um, there are no other questions I can see in the chat, and therefore it is yourself, Mr. Leader, to move the report.
thank you, Provost. Provost and councillors, back in June, this council approved our financial strategy. Central to our financial strategy is the medium term financial plan, which is before you today. The medium term financial plan is integral to the continued strong financial management of the council. Just yesterday, the Audit and Performance Committee considered the annual audit report. In that audit report, KPMG, our external auditors stated, and I quote, that the council have built on existing strong financial management and have developed financial models to demonstrate long term planning. Which is a, an admirable uh, commendation to our financial uh, team. And well deserved, I have to add. The medium term financial plan sets out the broad direction of travel for the council and includes high level commentary on the macroeconomic conditions that may influence public sector funding over the medium term. It includes the best estimates available at the current time, which will undoubtedly be reviewed and refreshed and reviewed again uh, between now and February. The medium term financial plan also signals the formal commencement of the budget process. Provost, I would like to draw elected members attention to a couple of areas in the report. Firstly, in line with our financial principles, elected members will note that the next, fe next February will be asked to set a three year revenue budget for 23-24, 24-25 and 25-26. I very much, along with many within this chamber, welcome this return to the development of multi year budget. It provides early notice to communities and partners of our direction of travel and makes it easier for our officers to plan the way that we will be moving forward. It also provides more time for officers to bring in forward other options to, as far as possible, mitigate the impact of what we will, will be some tough decisions over the next few years. Secondly, we are provided with an update on our reserves position. Our prudent use of the reserves serves two purposes. On one hand, they, they provide some protection from unexpected events such as severe weather or the situation we find our citizens find themselves in today. And we, we can apply these resources to where our citizens need them most. Support that has been seen that has seen over 1.5 million already committed to our residents since this administration took office. And promised as far as possible, we stand ready to apply more reserves as that what our citizens need to get through this cost of living crisis. Provost, I commend the medium term financial plan to the Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Leader. Councillor Donaldson to second the report. Provost, Deputy Provost Baileys and fellow councillors. I want to second Councillor Ang, eh, and in doing so, I want at this stage to thank uh, Stuart McKenzie, Scott Walker, John Jennings and all the others in the finance team for the work they've carried out and for the substance of this report. In what are unbelievably challenging times, and I'm afraid to say in the months ahead, they may well become more challenging yet. I do appreciate the updates provided by finance post the events uh, last week, and that's very helpful. But I want to say, I think this report has to be set in its full context. First of all, as a council, I've said it before and I'll say it again. We under statute have to produce a balanced budget. Fortunately, that's going to be over a three year period rather than one year, but nonetheless, that is our duty and we cannot borrow the uh, uh, funds the to um, to 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 uh, cover revenue expenditure we can't borrow to fi finance revenue expenditure secondly and however much you may disagree or agree with the scottish government it too is in a very similar position that it has to provide a balanced budget, much as Wales does as well. And I, we've got, to, and that has been the case since the Scottish Parliament came into effect in 1999. And then, 
there is the UK government. Much has been said already today, but quite frankly, I think the uh, uh, comments of the International Monetary Fund uh, overnight really are telling. And we are in a situation, it's almost uncharted territory. We've seen, for instance, uh, the IMF itself, we have not seen an intervention by uh, that body since the mid-1970s, since 1976. And you may remember then when Jim Callaghan, as Prime Minister, stated, crisis, what crisis? Well, I'll tell you this, we're certainly in a crisis now. We've seen sterling since last May devalue by some 25% against the dollar. And that matters in terms of our inflation assumptions because quite simply, the, uh, that devaluation raises because most commodities, uh, metals and also soft commodities are denominated in dollars. So that's one factor. Interest rates, 2.25%. It's not even impossible that you'll see an emergency meeting yet of the Monetary Policy Committee. And there's certainly talk of interest rates of 5, 6%. So really this is, and we saw today the Bank of England to maintain financial stability, uh, moving into the long end of the gilt market. Uh, we'll get more detail on that later, but there really is a real problem here. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult for us to uh, uh, for the budget process. I think the position is set out clearly on page 148. I think we're going to have to wait for the Scottish Government uh, emergency budget in, 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 in October. We have to, there's a variety of other factors we've got to feed in. Whether we can take a mid-range projection or whether as Councillor Barrett states, we have to be more pessimistic there is a danger, and I'll just say it, it's my own view, that if you're too pessimistic, you end up with a scorched earth policy. And in fact, it, 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 at longer term, medium to longer term, could prove to be counterproductive. It's going to be very difficult judgment to make between what cutbacks, what reductions in expenditure we make and our medium long term position. This is not going to be easy. And uh, there are going to be choices we're going to have to make that are going to be tough and really things we just never thought would happen. But we've got to do it in a fair and balanced way. It's got to be in accord with the principles set out in the corporate plan. And that's why, for instance, earlier today, uh, I, I was totally uh, approved of the 470,000 uh, going into anti-poverty measures. And we've really got to hold that up, that we serve the people of Perth and Kinross. We can't mitigate Kinshaw. all the difficulties that will come about, but we've got to make our best endeavours to assist, especially the weak, the vulnerable. I second this motion. Thank you, Councillor Donaldson. Um, are there any comments or amendments on the paper, Councillor Peter Barrett? Uh, councillors, um, last night I, I got terribly excited. Um, I received um, two invitations to attend uh, the Conservative Group's uh, Council pre-meeting. Um, and I, I, I thought there must be um, a mass defection uh, happening. Um, so when I joined the meeting, I was looking forward to seeing the uh, faces of all, all my new colleagues. Um, sadly, uh, none of them were, 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 were there. Um, and uh, Councillor Hearn was wondering who he'd forgotten to invite from his group in, in, in my place. Um, however, uh, jo all joking apart, um, I have to say that following the Chancellor's so-called mini-budget, Conservative members in this uh, chamber must be squirming in excruciating shame uh, and embarrassment. Uh, and I commend uh, those of you that are here uh, for your courage in, in turning up rather than hiding behind the uh, anonymity of a remote screen. 
Because to be honest, there's an awful lot that you should be ashamed of. Bankers' bonuses are back. Uh, sorry, Tax sorry. cuts for the rich are prioritised over help for the poor. Councillor Barrett, if we can maybe tone down the rhetoric very slightly, please. I I'll, appreciate I'll, I'll, there's, I'll there's do, a level. I'll of, do my best. That, uh, 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 I, I, I think would, I'm just welcoming your earlier comments where you were looking for that cross-party consensus. Ab so. Absolutely, and, we'll, and, and I'll come to I'll, I'll come to the olive branch uh, provost at the at the end of my speech. And to be honest, you know, uh, many members of this committee have had an awful lot of license in terms of what has been said uh, earlier. Absolutely, on. and I'm okay. I'm happy to give you that license. But Thank I just you. wanted to reflect on your earlier remarks. Okay. So instead of a windfall tax on the energy, energy giant's unearned and massive profits, profits derived solely from uh, Vladimir Putin's putting the gas supply screws on Europe while he engages in his illegal invasion and war in the Ukraine, instead of a fair windfall tax on those energy giants to protect families uh, this winter, the poorest in the middle are going to be squeezed tight to pay for, pay for that. No wonder people are outraged when big business and bankers are the priority for the Conservatives' new benefit system when the rest of the country experiences a cost of living crisis. This government's response isn't so much as let them eat cake, but let them eat, well, nothing. Compounded by the greed-driven lunacy of the abolition of the higher rate of tax. As we've heard, the markets have responded, UK bonds have tanked, the pound has plummeted, gilts have jumped overnight, 10-year bonds have leapt to over 4%, and 6% interest rates are being predicted next year. And the Bank of, Scot Bank of England eh, may have to call an imminent, imminent special meeting to raise rates. Mortgage pairs will suffer, new mortgages have been cancelled, new mortgage rates have doubled, and instead of the intended but crassly misguided overheating of the housing market, Liz Truss and Quasi Curtain are crashing it instead. As predicted by Richie Sunak, there is no trust bounce. Instead, we've gone straight from bust without the boom, and she really has hit the ground from day one. It's just that nobody knew it would be from quite such a height. This council will feel the brunt of the Tories' astonishing economic incompetence and mismanagement from the moment it comes to take out new borrowing for our capital programme. I don't know where our officers begin to refine the assumptions underpinning the medium-term financial plan, because they've all just been torn to shreds. Provost, I know that there are good people on the Conservative seats in front of me. People who must be sick to the stomach with the mini-budget announcement and the game-playing way in which it has been handled to avoid scrutiny and challenge. And to be honest, it's time for those people, for those of you with integrity, to say goodbye to Liz Trust. Trust even. I won't suggest that that's an easy decision, but it's not a betrayal like changing which football team you support. You didn't sign up to be quasi-Conservatives. And if this isn't the last straw, then you might never get the opportunity again to do, to do the right thing. If you genuinely want Perth to be, Perth and Can Ross to be a fairer, better place where so, you can devote uh, your entire energies uh, to tackling poverty Councilor and inequalities. Barrett, I have a point of order from Councillor Shires. You could switch your microphone. Oh. I don't really want to you know, challenge Councillor Barrett's comments, but I don't think uh, lecturing us about our political affiliations is really pertinent to the papers. I would agree. Um, Councillor Barrett, if you have anything left to say that is not personalised towards members in the chamber? I, I don't think I've said anything that has been personalised towards members of the of the chamber, Provost. I, I, think, I, think, I think members would disagree, perhaps, and I think I would also agree with them on that. So perhaps if we can well, in which case, Provost, I would just like to assure the Conservative members that my door is open. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor John Duff. Sorry, Councillor Duff, can you hold on? Please switch your microphone off. Councillor McEwen, you have a point of order. I'm just wondering where in standing order is the Provost that you're directing this uh, comments to this paper about the terrible financial position this country is in, the effect that it has on this council, and you seem to be trying to stifle debate that argues against the Westminster government. I'm just wondering where that comes in standing order, is that you're allowed to do that? Well, the standing order 16.3.1 is quite clear about um, being respectful towards other members in terms of the council's code of conduct. And in terms, I think I've been very lenient actually in terms of allowing debate what I was trying to control there was personalisation towards other members in the chamber. And as you know, I will always give people a right of reply. I didn't particularly want to go down the route of giving all 14 councillors of the members of the Conservative group the right of reply, because I think they might be here all afternoon. So I was merely trying to 
get Councillor Barrett to keep his very valid points um, about uh, the budget, etc., and the impact that was going to have on the council to depersonalise it. So I think if you watch back today, and I um, welcome you to do so, I think you'll find I've been very lenient um, around allowing people to have uh, discussion on this topic, including on earlier papers as well. I don't disagree with Councillor Shire's point of order or your handling of that, but that was the second time that you interjected during the comment by Councillor Barrett, not the first time. Indeed, because he hadn't listened to my earlier point, I think, was the problem there. I believe in freedom of speech. As do I, which is why I allowed him to continue and did not restrict him again, despite perhaps others wish. OK, um, Councillor John Duff. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Provost. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that uh, I'll keep my comments to matters relevant to Perth and Kinross Council. Uh, events in recent times show how fast moving the world of finance can be. It's always difficult for members with a few exceptions perhaps to get the, to grips with all the facts and figures presented to us in these papers. However, I think we are comforted by the fact that the, uh, there's proven ability in our finance director and his team uh, for the acknowledged way in which they look after our finances. Uh, Perhaps I don't want to say uh, much more than that, but I'll just finish by saying that um, thankfully, prudent maintenance of reserves in the past have given us a bit of flexibility today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor John Duff. Um, I don't see any other requests for comment, and therefore it's the Leader of the Council to sum up. I think, in the interests of us all, I'm happy to forgo that. Thank you very much. Um, therefore, members, can we agree the report? Thank you, members. Item 11, the 2023 committee timetable is deferred until the council meeting of the 9th of November, pending further discussion between political groups. Item 12 is appointments to outside bodies and spokesperson. Item 12, one, can the council agree that Councillor Peter Barrett be appointed as a further council representative on the Perth and Kinross Community Planning Partnership Board in his role as a quality spokesperson for the council? Agreed. Councillor Collins, do you have a question on this? Um, yeah, it's just um, a little bit of clarity, please. Um, Councillor Barrett's the equalities champion for the council. Um, but we do have um, champions for other people. And I'm wondering why, for example, the older people's champion or the veterans champion, both representing groups of people who um, uh, suffer, um, who are vulnerable and suffer um, substantial inequalities, why they're not um, represented on the board. Councillor Lane. Um, because um, I think that the board and speaking to uh, communicating with the, uh, our partners, uh, my co convener, who are very happy to have uh, Councillor Barrett back on the board because he's served it well over many years. And, and as I've said, I would always want the best man for the job. Um, and uh, that's why we've got such an adept uh, convener of scrutiny. Um, so I will continue. I, I, I will continue to ask people who can really put something forward to the uh, any committee or board because that's what we're trying to do. And I don't know if uh, anybody in this chamber would ever uh, expect me uh, in a past lifetime to say, but I think Councillor Barrett's the best man for the job. Okay, thank you. Person, Price. Uh, uh, yeah, I was coming to that, but I was really, I'm really just trying to expedite things here. But Councillor Stewart, does that answer your question? Thanks, Prof. It, it wasn't a, it wasn't a question about Councillor Barrett. It was a question about the, the the other champions that we have representing, you know, vulnerable groups that are liable to suffer from um, inequalities, and um, you know, the, the older people and the veterans in particular. In my view, it is, it, equality is, uh, it covers all the inequalities. Um, so I, I still th uh, I stand by it. And obviously, we, we'll listen to anybody that comes along. And, and uh, um, with the, the task force that's coming forward as well, these people will all have an avenue to, to feed in. Colin, I'm happy to listen to MD moving forward. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Um, can we agree the appointment? 
Agreed. Thank you. Item 12.2. Um, the Council has asked to agree that Councillor John Duff be appointed as the Council's Gaelic Medium Education spokesperson. Are we all agreed? Thank agreed. you. Um, item 13 is elected members briefing notes um, and I'm asking members to note the elected member briefing notes that have been issued since our last Council meeting on the 17th of August. Can we agree to note those? Thank you. Um, now, Councillor, just before we finish today's meeting, um, I would like to uh, thank you all for your contributions today. Um, and uh, I would also like to uh, give the Leader of the Council and Councillor Duff the opportunity to uh, say something about the MOD, which you'll all be aware is coming to Perth. So, Mr Leader. Uh, Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to promote another event in Perth, which we should all be promoting and hopefully um, we'll be able to get to, to witness some of it and it'll be a fantastic uh, event for Perth moving forward. Um, learning from lessons within this chamber in the past, I've decided that I will not uh, make an attempt uh, to speak in Gaelic, as a, a previous colleague of mine did. So again, following on uh, the best man for the job, um, I'm going to hand over to Councillor Duff to uh, give it justice in the way that we should be welcoming the MOD in, in, in their native tongue. Thank you. Councillor Duff, um, as the best person for the job, would you like to uh, say a few words? Tapalai ve froish des fiskar magriv ulla. Ha och blie na jeek vo, va mod na shenteril ansen valavor vrie sho meyerig. Ha na vies es e sho a chiet turis vo da vila sekeha. Ha ha piast irech a horst an tachetis sho a ha chiet blie na satrichet a gerej. A koharig kanen kulter. Dulchish is Cardis Nagalic. A cohle of yars, the Schion Ross, Erevi and Coney and Sass, Aunavi a Kurtaich Grigalic. A toast Anya don Nagalic, my first latcherje of Dulchus. A mod, Shirach, Fiars, Agis English, Kiet Blaine a Gerge and Avlina. Agis Hoshich, Common Gallic Piars, Aunanoch, Kiet Jerk, Sakeher Fichet. Mar Utaras Yenatil, a half a freelich, Rune Mveskische, Jehulteren. Hashin Jalasach, a hiv, Lesach, a yen of Agasteicha Horst, do ar Narav Sluai Gagalik, a hulig er Luch Yunsachig, Ur, of Rosnacher. Hashin a coya terrest, refalch of lag, Piast the Schem Ross, a hur er the Compartichen. Luchestich agis oyen ulugulier. A hulugier koharag mirvelich nagalig. Hashin and Dochus can gav a hula denye korum er naha ek piast. Agis eken skira mun kurst and rehavin a hiv kusperin kulterach tachatusen taringach agis vuchin nyo eishmelich. A froest. Ha kohle fjast is kjoen ros a kur falche er a vod nashenta regel gupjast. Agis hashin doches gumbi unye erle ek a hula dunye moren tang. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Duff. Um, and I will now close the meeting formally and we look forward to seeing you all in about six weeks time and we look forward to welcoming the mod in a couple of weeks time. Thank you very much councillors, have a lovely evening.